Hello everyone, welcome to another video. Today we're going to be looking at this PlayStation 5 which has been sent in. This has actually been sent in by a business to business customer after his neighbour got in touch with him and said that they've had a lightning strike hit the house and it's damaged two PlayStation 5s as well as every single other electronic device in the house. So everything that was plugged on, plugged in at the time, they have basically lost the TV, the modem, the PlayStation 5s, and along with pretty much everything else. I don't know exactly what, but he said that it took literally everything out. So this is gonna be an interesting one. It's one of two. I've got the other one in the queue, and I'm gonna be looking at that one straight after this one. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can figure it out. I also have, some PlayStation 5 encoders now. I bought them on AliExpress last week. They are available, but I am going to be testing them very, very soon. Maybe in this video, it might have taken out the encoder. So maybe I'll test them in this video and then we'll find out whether they're fakes or not. But yeah, it just depends what's wrong with this one. And if not, then I'm going to use one of my own consoles to test these on. So with that being said, if you are new to the channel and you like this type of content, number one, please get subscribed. Stop being a damn meanie because I'm sick of putting that image up on the screen now. And uh, number two, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up if you enjoy it at the end as well. And also, if you want to support me, there's a link to Patreon in the video description. There's also a link to my Twitch channel where you can head over there, link an Amazon Prime account and become a Twitch Prime subscriber. That's absolutely free for you to do. It takes a couple of minutes to link your Amazon account to Twitch and you can literally subscribe for free on Twitch and it helps me out massively. I really do appreciate all of the support that people have been giving me lately. And I've got some interesting content coming up. So yeah, make sure you're subscribed anyway. So with that being said, let's grab a nice cup of coffee. This is my mate Vince Merch. You can check his merch out on Puddle along with mine. I'll leave a link in the video description. But uh, they make the coffee taste better. So, yeah, get some merch. Ah, beautiful. Anyway, let's get into this repair. Before we get into this repair, I do just want to thank PCBWay for sponsoring today's video. PCBWay are the industry leader in custom PCB printing. Personally, I've had projects printed by PCBWay and I was genuinely impressed with the quality of the products I received. The order was processed in less than 24 hours and it was at my door within a week. The order process, even for myself as a complete and utter noob, was super simple to do. Just fill out the quick start wizard, upload the Gerber files and they take care of the rest. PCBWay also offer custom CNC machine parts as well as both 3D printing and injection moulding services and right now they're even offering 10% off your first project. If you need inspiration they've even got a shared project section where you can see what other people are creating, you can download their project files or simply add your own twist and create something completely new. So a massive thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring today's video, now let's get back to it. So I'm going to plug this in. Uh, let's see if we've got any life at all. Okay, the disk drive button does work. And it's a constant single beep. Okay, so basically what's happening here is when we're pressing the power button, it's attempting to turn on. So that's not going to be the power supply, or as a general rule, it's not going to be the power supply that's at fault, which is great because that makes a more interesting video. But it's likely going to be that it's taken something out on the motherboard. And the things that we can take out, we've got to think of what could possibly go wrong. So if the lightning strike didn't go down the power circuit, so down through the main power, then it's got to have come through the HDMI because that's the only other thing that's plugged in, or the ethernet, if they've got it connected to an ethernet cable. So one of those two things realistically. So because we know that the power supply is kind of working, it really shouldn't be that it's gone down through the power supply because it would have taken the power supply out. Now the power supplies are expensive, so that is good news as well because it might be a little bit cheaper for the customer. But the only things that really leaves that are plugged into something that the lightning strike can go down is going to be the HDMI circuit or an Ethernet. So it's likely going to be one of those two. It's likely going to be an issue with the Ethernet circuit or the HDMI circuit. So anyway, I'm not going to waffle on for much longer because, uh, yeah, I need to conserve my voice. I did lose my voice recently. So let's just pop it open. 
if we can ever get the thing open. I hate these things. Let me move my coffee out of the way. I've got a feeling this might scratch the case while I'm trying to get it off. There we go. Oh no, it's fine. Okay. And the good news is the warranty stick is intact. And I know that no one's messed with this. And another reason I know that no one's messed with it is because, like I said, this is the business to business console repair london it is their neighbor who sent this and they've sent two of them so it is going to be interesting let me just get rid of that sticker so as i don't dox my customers or his customers rather technically not my customers he's my customer okay so i'm going to get this apart it's going to take me a little while to do because these are a pain in the backside I'll fast forward through all of this kerfuffle because, yeah, like I said, it is pretty time consuming. So I'm going to fast forward through all of this lot and, uh, yeah, we'll see you on the other side. And uh, boom, just like that. We are done. Now, that's the good thing about a video. You guys don't have to go through that. It's really annoying, honestly. The amount of screws in there, I mean, just look at it. It's ridiculous. But never mind. So what I'm going to do first, first thing I always do is just check a few voltage rails while the board is still inside the housing. This is a V1 board, EDM010, so I know where all the voltage rails are going to be on this one. So I'm going to go into voltage mode and the first thing we're going to test is going to be the 12 volt rail. And yep, 12.06, that seems pretty stable to me. Let's test this 5 volt rail up here. Okay. 3.3 volt. Okay. 5 volt here. Yep. 5 volt here. Yep. 3.3. Mm hmm. Okay. 5 volt. 2 volt. 12 volt. Yeah. If you do hear any background noise, it is raining outside. My apologies. Hold up, it might appear short. Hmm. Maybe. Okay. I think I need to take the board out. Cool. That does appear short but the problem with that line is that line the capacitor seems to hold a charge for quite a while and it could show as short even when it's not so I'm just going to drain power and then hopefully it's fully drained before the time I get the board out and uh, let's do a few tests around here shall we That's still showing a short. So we've got a bank of capacitors just down here by F7501. Yeah, that's not short. Okay. Uh oh. Okay, it looks to me like the encoder is short. Let's pop it under the microscope, I'll show you where I'm testing. Okay, so we've got the HDMI port here, and if you look just below there, we've got the HDMI encoder. That's the MN864739. Uh, basically, what this chip is responsible for is taking the HDMI signals or the display signals, because they actually come from the APU as display port signals. And the HDMI encoder is responsible for converting them and then sending them out to the HDMI port. One way that we can test this encoder is to check some of these caps around the bottom. And I've got one probe connected to ground. Let's just see if I can, there we go. So you can see my probe just off to the right hand side. I'm connected to ground. So the bottom is ground, but the top is not. And these are short into ground. So I've got the meter in continuity mode and it's giving me a direct short.
by the way, I am testing the input side of these caps. The input side is closest to the HDMI chip itself. Yeah, they're all sorted. The entire encoder is shorted, which means, or rather all of the caps around it are, in, are shorted. So that means that the encoder is definitely bad. So I'm gonna get the encoder off. And the good news is we get to test one of these new encoders now. Someone actually asked me about this yesterday. About this exact issue and the exact cause of the issue. So I've got my hot air set at 480 degrees Celsius. It's a very high temperature area. And that liquid that I've just put on there is called flux. That just helps solder to flow. Okay, so there's the old encoder and one thing I did notice when I was looking at it was it did look kind of black on the top of the chip. So yeah, that could have been an indication that it's bad, but that chip is definitely bad and I'm going to say that the short is probably gone now. So let's just test again for one probe on ground. So you can see there we've got to contact the ground. And now if we test. So the bottom is ground. The top is not. And as you can see, no short. So that means that we have just cleared that short. And realistically now if we change this in cold out, it should. The keyword here is should, but it should fix the issue. So while the board is still warm, I'm just going to flood it with some isopropyl alcohol. So I'm going to clean up and then I can prep the area for a new chip. So I'm going to test these new chips that I bought on AliExpress. And I'm really, really hoping I don't end up having to send them back. I have got some donors. So I've got boards with these chips on, but I'm really hoping they are the real deal. And that's crazy, the isopropyl alcohol is actually taking the conformal coating off, check that out. That's mad. And that side as well. That's nuts. But anyway, that's clean. And ready to start being prepped for a new chip. So what I'll do is I'll just add some flux. And then I'm going to take some leaded solder. And apply some to my iron. And then I'm just going to tin these pads. There we go. So, in here I've got five brand new chips. They literally come this morning. And these are the, apparently, the MN864739. So like I said, I'm going to be trying these today. Uh, they do look okay, but... <laughs> Yeah, the fakes look really good. It's just whether or not they actually work and whether or not they actually work in 4K. So, yeah, fingers crossed they are the real deal. So here are the brand new chips, and they do look brand new as well. As you can see, there's no oxidation on these either, so it looks like they've just come off the off the factory line. So, yeah, what I am going to do is just pre-tin this chip just because this is a rather large chip and not only that, I want to give it every possible chance to work. So I am really skeptical about these chips, but unfortunately, because we can't actually buy them from the manufacturer, from Sony or directly from Panasonic, who is the manufacturer of the chips, because we can't get them directly from them, we basically have to just hit and hope when it comes to AliExpress and doing our parts shopping on Chinese websites. So AliExpress is generally okay, whoops. It's generally okay in terms of chips and stuff, but you do get fakes and AliExpress does cover us. So I spent 150 pound on these chips because with tax that come to just very slightly over 30 pound per unit. But obviously, you know, that gets passed on to the customer. But unfortunately, they're the only ones that I've found, or that anyone's found even. 
So I'm going to do the same with the chip as I did with the pads on the board. Just going to run the iron over. The one thing I hate about pre tinning chips is the flux just flies everywhere and uh, it's really awkward to keep the flux in one place. So basically I'll just pile a bit of flux on top of it. So there we go. So that's pre-tinned and fingers crossed it's actually going to work. So I am going to drop my hot air down to 440 degrees Celsius now at 40% airflow. I don't want to risk damaging the chip, so I'll lower my melting temperature a little bit, or rather lower my hot air temperature a little bit, just to give it a fighting chance, basically. So I'm just going to clean this off, and then I can check the alignment and make sure that it's number one aligned properly, and number two that it's sat down flat. And then I'll go around the edges and just re-solder all of the joints. Alright, let's scrub it with a toothbrush as well, just to clean it fully. So it's not completely soldered yet. But I am assuming that it's lined up nicely. And uh, yeah, okay. So now I know it's lined up properly, the chip is sitting flat, and I know that it's gonna be good to go. I can tin the rest of the pads. So all I'll do for that is just use a little bit of solder and run the iron tip over the edge. So because I'm using a really small tip, this is a 0.6 millimeter tip. So because I'm using a small tip, I'm gonna be using hot air to assist me. So I'll just blast it with hot air. and then run the iron over at the same time. And after every side, I'll just remove the hot air, just for a few seconds, just to let it cool back down. Uh, this micro tip is not working so i'm going to switch back to my normal tip right i'm really struggling with this top of this chip let's try it from this side so i'll switch it round I'm not really fussed if I don't end up getting this pad because that is ground so I'm not really bothered about that one but I am going to try but I'm not going to worry too much more about it I think it's just this corner There we go, that got it. Okay, there we go. That looks really well lined up. That looks really well lined up. So yeah, I'm happy. So before I go any further, I'm just gonna come down here to the HDMI port. I'm gonna test a random pin. So, well, I'll say random, it's gonna be the end one. So I'm going to pop my meter into diode mode. I'm going to pop my red probe on ground and I'm just going to test one of these data lines here. In fact, I can test them from here. So I can test them from the filters here. No 0.763. 
and 0.763. Those data line readings look good to me. I think this might work. I think these chips might be legitimate. So yeah, I'm getting good readings on those data lines, which is absolutely fantastic because that gives it a bit more chance that it's actually gonna be a legitimate chip. I really hope it is, and if it is, I'll probably buy another 10 immediately. I know they're expensive, but yeah, I'm gonna need them, and I wanna have some in stock. All right, so that's that. So let's just pop the heatsink back on, and then I'm gonna leave it like that just for testing, just to make sure that everything works, or rather just to make sure the encoder works. And hopefully that solves the issue as well. I've just realised that we don't even know if it turns on yet. We don't have a clue if it turns on. But we're about to find out. So I've got it hooked up to the TV. It is a PlayStation, so I can't use the capture card. Moment of truth. Is it going to work? No. I really thought that was going to work. Oh, that sucks. That sucks, man. Oh. See, now the thing is, I don't know if it's the encoder or not. Right, so the problem here now is that I don't know whether it's that encoder or whether it's something completely different, but the symptoms have slightly changed. So before I changed the encoder, it was attempting to turn on, but then as soon as you press the button again it will beep again but this one doesn't it's a few seconds in between which is really weird so let's just test for some voltages we've got five volts there we've got 3.3 .3 volts there 3.3 .3. Five. Yeah, so this is, I mean, the, the test voltages are there by the look of it anyway. One point one is there as well. Okay, so yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't know what to think with this. So I think the only thing I can really do is take an encoder from a donor board and try that. Okay, let's just pop it back under the microscope a sec. So I just want to inspect these pads as close as I possibly can yeah so that's definitely lined up on the top and it doesn't look like we've got any bridges there's one pad in the middle of those data lines it looks like there's not much solder there but I can see a contact between the pad and the pad that's on the chip so I mean that I think is a ground anyway looks like there's enough solder on those pads and it does look like everything's lined up that looks okay there and that looks okay there so I just want to make sure I haven't got any solder that's flew off anywhere or anything like that you know any bridges between two pads or anything no I'm not seeing anything Let's just check around the Ethernet. Okay, a bit strange. I'm not getting any reading on this side of these resistors. Just coming up open line. Hmm. Let's check this on a donor board. Yeah, coming up open line on the donor as well. 
Don't know, is that because it's not connected to an Ethernet cable? Maybe. Right, so these first three, I am getting a short. I don't know if that's normal. I don't think it would be. They look like data lines to me because these look like some sort of pairs. You know, these two here being exactly the same length. But they're showing up as short. Just have a look on a donor board. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm getting short. I'm getting uh, a reading on this, 0 0.388. But then on the donor board, it shows up as short. So is it that cheap? Now the problem is I don't know where that goes to. Once it comes from the chip, I do not know where it goes to. Let's just try removing that chip. I am going to need to remove it from the other side of the board. I've got the board hanging over the edge of the table. And I'm going to add some flux. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to heat up from underneath the board. And you'll start to see this flux melt. And it's just going to transfer the heat through the board and stop it from melting the chip. This is nothing wrong with it, I don't want to change it. There we go. Okay. So let me just test this again with the multimeter. I realise that you can't see the multimeter, but you know I'm sure you trust my uh, my readouts. Still showing a short. I don't know where that goes to. That's the problem. I don't know where it goes to. Alright, so I've retinned those, ready to put the chip back when I'm ready. Okay, so they go through the board by the look of it. And it looks like they come through to here. But where do they go from there? I honestly don't know. So I'm going to put my multimeter into continuity. I'm just going to sit here and hunt through the board. I'll, I'll fast forward through this, but basically I'm just going to keep one probe connected on this pin here. And then, so you can see there that we've got a short showing there. In fact, I'm probably going to need to do this on the board where it's not shorted. Actually, no, let's just inject some voltage and find the hotspot, shall we? So. When we're injecting voltage, what we're doing is we're using the bench power supply to force voltage through the board, right? And basically what that will do is, because the line is shorted, electricity is always going to take the path with the lowest resistance. So it wants to get an easier a journey as it possibly can. So it takes the path with the lowest resistance and basically that's going to heat up because it's taking a lot of current or it should so I'm drawing at one volt on this data line here I'm drawing 0 0.266 amps so 266 milliamps of current so I'm gonna have to increase voltage so now I'm at 1.2 volts I'm drawing 280 milliamps I'm, I'm going to feel around and just see if I can find a hot spot. The problem is the board is still a little bit warm as well. I think the safe bridge might be getting too hot. At 2 volts I'm drawing 500 milliamps. Yes, the safe bridge is getting hot. So here's the safe bridge. I'm injecting 2 volts and I'm drawing 400 milliamps. Tip some isopropyl alcohol over there. It was getting warm on the safe bridge a second ago. Oh, it still is. Yeah. You see that?
Yeah, the safe bridge is getting hot. So, basically the safe bridge is responsible for every input and output device. So you've got USBs, you've got HDMI, you've got the Ethernet, pretty much everything is responsible for. I have stopped injecting voltage now, by the way. And like I said, one of the things is the Ethernet. And when this goes bad, it's going to show up a short somewhere. And um, because it's showing up a short, it's not going to it's not going to work. So yeah, if I remove, so let me just show you really quickly when I probe this pin. So if I probe this bottom pin here, I've got one probe on ground. And I've just realised that I don't have my probes plugged in. Let me just get rid of a bit of this flux quickly. So I've warmed the flux up just so I can mess around in that area. There you go. So I'm shorted to ground right now. And those two first pins, or the end two, are shorted to ground. And when I inject voltage into that line, it's heating up the south bridge. So if I remove this south bridge now, chances are that short is going to disappear. Which means we're going to have to replace the south bridge. Okay, so there's the safe bridge removed. And what I'll do, just to make sure we've got no shorts on any pin, I'll add some more flux. And I'm basically just going to run the soldering iron over the pins and replace it with some leaded solder. And that'll just clean up the pads and make sure that we've got no shorts. Now the problem is the console will not turn on at all without the safe bridge, it won't even attempt to beep because the safe bridge also handles the power rails. So I'll replace that with leaded solder. There we go. Let's pop one probe on ground. We're still in continuity as you can see. And yep, that short is gone. That sucks. That sucks. So I'm going to pause the video for a minute and I'm just going to call the customer and get confirmation that I can do the job. Right, so I've sent a text message to the business because they're not actually open today, it's Saturday, so they're not technically open. So what I want to do, rather than just waste a load of time, I mean, I do always have the option to just take my safe bridge back off if the customer says no. But ideally I need to be reboiling this now or rather replacing it now just for confirmation as well. Oh, there we go. I don't know if you can hear that vibrating. Okay, I'll pause again. Right, okay. So I've just spoken to the business and he doesn't know if they're going to be willing to pay it, right? So for the sake of this video and just for the sake of getting information out there, I am going to replace this safe bridge right now. And... You know, I, I'm i probably going to have to end up taking it back off. But the problem is, normally, if it was just a normal chip, if it was, you know, um, something like a MOSFET or a regulator, something I can get easily, then I'd be more than happy to just leave the chip on there and just say, you know what, forget it, blah, blah, blah. But if they're not willing to pay the amount, then I'm going to have to take this chip back off because I can't leave it on there because I've only got this one. This is literally the only safe bridge I have. And if I can't use this on this console, I'm gonna to need to use it on another console where I am gonna get paid. And these actually fail a lot more often than people think. But I want confirmation and not only that, I want the information to go out there to the public. So I might be wasting half an hour in reboarding this chip. But I think it's worth the half an hour in reboarding it and potentially another half an hour to take it back off just for the sake of knowing that this is the fault and knowing that we are able to fix lightning like, strike consoles sort of thing. Oh, 
Alright, so I've taken that off uh, as safely as I can. So there's the chip. So I'll move the board out of the way and I'll bring this into focus here. So I'm going to get this chip installed into my chip holder so as I can hold it nice and still. So yes, I might be wasting my time on this. I'm going to make sure I don't bend this chip because I've done that once on one of these encoders and it's not funny. <laughs> It's not funny when I do it. You just have to make sure I don't bend it or close it too tightly. And you bend the chip and it's game over for that chip. And like I said, this is the only chip that I have. Bending it is not an option. So I'm replacing the solder on here with leaded solder. We do that just to lower the melting temperature while we're working with the chip but it's also going to remove any oxidation from the chip as well. So now what I'll do is just take a little bit of solder braid. That's basically just copper braid. And I'm going to wick this chip away. All right, so I'm going to use some hot air to assist me. Just because I don't want to risk pulling pads. Again, like I said, it's kind of imperative that I don't damage this chip. All right, so that's wicked away, but I do need to just clean it and then wick it once more. So I always give it two passes with the wick just to make sure it's nice and flat. All right, so that was pass number one. So I'll add some more flux. Add a little bit more wick. And there we go. And yeah, that looks fine. Looks nice and flat. So what I need to do to reboard it then is I just need to add a little bit of flux first of all and just spread that out. And when I say a little bit, I mean that's too much, what's on there now. So I just want a really thin layer of flux over the top just to hold the solder balls in place and give it somewhere to bite to. And then I'm going to drop on a stencil. So these solder balls are 0.5 millimeters leave that there for a minute it's not in line but don't worry just leave it there for a minute so as I can get my solder balls ready and I'm just going to drop solder balls over the top so usually you would use a jig for this but unfortunately I don't know where mine is so normally you would use a jig and you would just shake the solder balls around I'm just going to place them manually because I really can't be bothered to find my jig So I'll just remove the remaining balls out of the way. Give them a little bit of a wiggle. And then just... Lift up. Oh, damn it. I screwed it up. <laughs> oh, oh, no. All right. Well, I messed that up a little bit. Hmm. You know what? I'll just position them by hand. Why not? Let's just position them by hand. I really need to find my jig so I don't have to move those manually. So I'm just going to nudge them into place. And this is why I tell people quite often I suck with stencils. So I just need to wick away the solder that's on here and clean these pads up as well. So as this is ready for a new chip, we need these pads as flat as we can get them. So I'm going to be doing a couple of passes on here as well, probably two or three. And again, I'm going to be using some hot air to assist me, just because I don't want to damage the pads. And uh, actually, no, you don't. That is absolutely fine. Don't need to give that a second run. So I'm going to get it roughly in line then. And then I'm just going to press down on the chip and wiggle it with my fingers. And if it's in line, then it shouldn't move when I'm wiggling it. 
Let's make sure it doesn't stick to my finger. Oh, ha, ha, no. All right, so let me show you an example. So it's not in line now, and you'll see that it's going to move around. If I get this lined up, as soon as it finds its place, it's going to lock in, and the balls are going to bite down onto the board. And there we go. So that should be perfectly aligned. Yeah, look at that. Spot on. Oh, yeah. All right, so let's flow this down. 440 degrees Celsius, 40% airflow. All right, so that should be soldered, but not 100%. So what I do now is just add more flux and reflow it once more. Okay, that's reflowed, and that is or should be soldered. Just hope that it didn't take too much heat to do. Let's just give this a quick test, and then I'm going to put the chip back on there. And um, yep, no short. So, whoops, that's way too much flux on that side. Ah, it's fine. It'll clean up. It'll clean up fine. All right. So I'm going to solder this by hand. Okay, so there's one side done. Hmm. Maybe it's not a good idea to solder that by hand. Hmm. Nah, I'm going to change it now. Stuff it. Alright, lesson, lesson of the day. Don't try and solder that chip by hand. Always do it with heat from underneath the board. grab this one off the donor board off camera oh well that's pretty cool we can see inside them chips on some of these boards check that out just a bunch of inductors by the look of it cool all right that's in line or thereabout surface tension will pull that in okay here we go five four Three, two, one. Close enough. Yep, okay. Right, so one thing you should probably know, I am going to clean this board, but I can't put this console back together yet anyway, because I need to find out 100% that the customer is going to pay the bill. So I'm not going to clean the board up on the video. I'm going to just test it and hopefully the, hopefully it actually works. So I'm just going to test it, make sure it boots up and whatnot. And uh, yeah, call it good for that. I will clean that board. I will not leave that board with flux all over it, whether the customer pays or not, or whether the customer is willing to pay or not. I will never leave flux all over the board. That's not how I do things. But this video has been going on now for two and a half hours. Obviously, you're going to get a much edited version, a much shorter version rather. Much edited? Yeah, you're getting a much edited version and uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's been going on too long for me. It's going to take me a long time to edit two and a half hours of footage down to, you know, 20, 30 minutes of time. Because every time I make a long video, I'll get complaints. All right. Please work. Yes. We've got a blue light. Come on. Go to a white light. Go to a white light. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yes. We've got a white light. Oh, oh, yes, we've got a white light. I'll sound like the Churchill dog. Oh, yes. 
<clears throat> That's what I'm talking about. Please. Oh, it says PlayStation 5. And the chips are real. Yes. Mm, come on, baby. Let's go. Yes, I look tired, and that is because I am. I've been working on this for almost three hours just to figure out that fault. The things I do for repairs just to get something working again. <laughs> I shouldn't have spent three hours on this. Wow. I should not have spent three hours on this. But hey, it's working. Yes! Let's see if it focuses for you. Yeah. The chips are real. Buy away, people. Buy away. That's awesome. That is awesome. I am going to buy some more of them. That is fantastic that we can actually get those chips now. Because now I don't have to charge customers stupid amounts of money just to fix those issues. That is awesome. We get 4K. Uh, obviously, this still needs a full test. I'm not going to do that until I know the customer is willing to pay. And if the customer is not willing to pay, then I'll just reball their chip. And but in fact, I probably won't even reball it. I'll probably just run over it with the soldering iron and drop it on. It's shorted. It don't work, so it doesn't matter. Uh, I'll, technically, I wouldn't even need to put that back on. It is 100% shorted, so technically, I wouldn't even need to put that chip back on. But I would anyway, just out of respect for the customer. But if they're not willing to pay it, then I will take my chip back because I know it works. And I'll also keep this chip here, this encoder here with their console just in case because i'm not i'm not even wasting an encoder these encoders cost 30 pound each and that is at china prices to buy those in the uk you're looking at 50 so yeah is it worth it debatable but yeah i can't believe i got it working that's fantastic that is going to be it for this video thank you very much for watching if you do have any comments or questions leave them in the comment section down below if you do want to support me in any way there's a patreon link in the video description there's also a twitch subscription link in the video description so you can go over there and you can subscribe on twitch whether that's paid or through prime it doesn't matter it all helps out the channel and i really do genuinely appreciate it you can also become a channel member by clicking on the join button just below the video and that is conveniently located right by the subscribe button so if you not subscribed make sure you hit subscribe i really do appreciate it thank you all for watching i've really enjoyed this one really glad to at least get it working just to get the information out there and help some other people out with their own repair in the future so until next time i'll see you later bye for now